I'll be starting my speech in three, two, one. It is important that we prioritize the rights of every single African. Now, we as proposition come to you today to advocate that there be a specific project dedicated to reducing inequality within African countries. Now, firstly, what do we need to prove? That number one, it is legitimate for the AU to be the one that is imposing this specific pro project. And number two, that the actual issue of there being an inequality exists, so there is a necessity as well as the fact that there is urgency for this matter. Now, firstly, some criteria on when do we decide that an individual or an organization needs to act. Number one, when there is a need to act is in this motion, this looks like when we are facing structure, um, we are facing skyrocketing, skyrocketing femicide, child marriage, and where we find that women's liberties are extremely restricted and also when there's an incentive and there's a mandate to act and that will be I'll get into that when I talk about the mandate that exists within the AU organization but first of all some contextualization what does the what do African countries and nations look like this consists of various developing countries that face a host of social and economic issues such as high unemployment mass poverty a lack of access to education and health etc on top of that they face hostility and inequality um, towards women and their trajectory and existence within these spaces. Now, this rides deeply on entrenched ideologies that do not, that we find that they do not die down within these African nations. Thus, we find that it is very effective, that we, it is very imperative that we then go on to implement policies and actually have organizations that go on to push the um, mitigation of the effects and actions of this ideology. So we need to have these impeded by policies, for example, quota systems. Now, this ideology t stems from and is based in rooted in the idea that women are less than men in various ways. They are less than men in their competency, their authority, their ability to engage economically, etc. And this is manifested as women being provided less opportunities in the workspace, especially in executive high earning positions, high training positions, a host, a large amount of sexual violence that women have to go through that is not often seriously taken and effectively addressed that because of the excuse made that is then the fault of the women that they are experiencing such violence and also they are, um, they're having been numerous abuse cases that not only are ineffectively addressed because of how what I explained about, women are often placed at fault. Um, for the violence that they are subjected to. But additionally, these tend to happen for a long time simply because women do not feel safe within judicial systems and they do not feel safe with the policing, the ineffectiveness of policing within the countries they reside and the fact that these often work against them or do not, or merely just do not work to necessarily help them against the people they're trying to get protection from. Also the fact that young girls are kept from education due to the idea that education is meant for male individuals and that girls are meant to stay at home that is often found in African um, communities because of their concerns because they tend to lean towards the conservative nature and also not having access to certain rights such as property rights, reproductive rights, as well as working rights. Now, um, why is this a problem? This, for, this is where you find that an active harm is done to the rights of women because we violate them. When nothing is done to, the violate, to address the violation of these rights that women have, we set the idea that either number one, women are not fully deserving of rights, thus we dehumanize them. Because when we have an when we exist the notion in society that human rights are to be afforded to all humans and then you go on to limit the rights of women then you find that we are either telling you that, that we are telling you that women do not are not fully encompassing the nature of what we consider to be human. So we threaten the idea of humanness as well. And also number two, that rights can be, if we also enforce the idea that rights can be harmed unjustifiably to a certain extent and towards a certain demographic of, human, of humans. This threatens the safety and validity of human rights as a whole, because when we can limit and we can harm the rights of one individual, unjustifiably so, or one demographic, unjustifiably so, what stops us from limiting and harming the rights of other demographics that go on to persist? and exist. Practically, this also looks like exacerbating social and economic issues as even when you're trying to improve the um, 
development within these nations, this improvement is only given, the consequences of this, this improvement is only felt by the men within the society and is more received by them due to the inequalities that I've raised above. But also, when you find that most of these, most of these consequences are often received by the men in the system, you find that half of the population lacks the benefit of whatever development that you talk about. That's development cannot exist fully and wholly. And further, also, you, 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 you don't benefit because you lack you have half of your population lacking access to um, the economic space. You inhibit about half of the population or half of the demographic from being contributors to even the economic space. So the, even the economic development that you want to achieve is then slowed down because half of the demographic isn't working within that space to improve and develop the space. Thus, we go on to show you why that thus the AU, it is an AU's incentive and within their mandate as as an organization that tries to improve the economic space, the social space, and general development within African countries to um, engage this project and to engage in forcing the lack of inequality. Yes. The AU made an agreement to ensure that we recognize gay rights. After that, Uganda made homophobia a normalized thing. Okay. Um, I'm going to take it that you are questioning the validity of the AU and the ability to enforce policy. But then that goes to the idea of now what makes you think that they are valid to enforce the whole 2063 agenda? Are you now saying that they should not enforce it at all because they are invalid or that they are inadequate? You go on to improve the validity. You go on to improve the adequacy. You don't just say they can't do it because we find that they may be inadequate in enforcing it. You improve the enforcement. You don't completely scrap the idea and the goal. But also, another specification that I need to make is the type of feminism that we are referring to and why this is important. We are specifically referring to African feminism specifically because it tackles the qualms of an African woman in daily life and we found find that even in the global space where you do have like Western feminism that exists, the wins that you find in Western feminism and the focus of Western feminism is not necessarily on the challenges that African countries face, but rather when you find a win in Western feminism in generally liberal societies, this does not translate to a win for Africans in, um, in often conservative societies. So they need to be able to establish um, systems that are able to protect them and advocate for them so they can also get their own wins. But additionally, what would this um, look like when we actually apply it into the world? So this would look like improving human rights and the protection of these rights for women as well as enforcing already existing protection that we find may not be necessarily effective. For example, enforcing and ensuring that more women and girls um, find their space in the educational world and also intensifying legislation in regards to enforcing their rights and additionally, purposefully and intentionally placing women in political and co company projects project leadership in order to allow them to um, advocate for the women that exist on the ground and also the, they would then be incentivized to introduce other women um, into these spaces as well. So why do we prioritize having the AU do this again? So when I explained to you that within the AU's mandate, they hold the ideology that they want to relieve African countries from oppression and that they want to allow for prosperity within African countries and avoid inequality because of all the characterization I provided on the harms that would not employing because of all the characteristics I provided, it shows you that it is in the best interest of the AU to then go on to enforce this um, project and uh, to enforce a project on this basis. But at the same time, we tell you that it is important, it is exceptionally important that um, this is not something that the AU, AU sees as a fun little side quest, but it has to be a priority in achieving genuine emancipation and development within these African countries. Cool. Three, two, one. Poor women of color in villages are terrorized, not only by the men around them, but by the oppressive governments that allow that harm to take place in the first place. As we speak, there are mothers in Sudan who are running from gunfire. These are the women who matter, the women with the most amount of tears in their eyes, the women with their lives and their belongings in their hands. We're going to show you why we have the highest quality of policies created for these women and that why that's important. In an attempt to show you why that's true, some set up, then rebuttal, then two arguments. The first, on the illegitimacy to have the AU implement these policies. The second, on why they have ineffective policies on their side and the worst amount of change for women. And in the civil speech, an argument about why it is that you're likely going to deprioritize the issues women are facing. Before that though, some set up. Two parts here. One, we would have we would not prioritize women or feminist projects in the AU. We think it's not only one decisive, divisive, but two inefficient. 
we note that that doesn't mean we're not, we're not anti-feminist, but we're rather anti-AU feminist action. We think they're uniquely the worst actor to do this, and we think they're going to have the lowest level of implementation. Note that in the worst of cases in which the status quo is so urgent and the status quo is so dire, we would have regional bodies that put an emphasis on things like the progression of feminist rights. That's uniquely different and comparatively better from their side because you have a concentration of cultural ideologies, but you have a concentration of countries that are likely in the same types of positions. Second part of the setup. We're willing to trade off feminist-specific policies in the worst case in which those are unachievable in the short term. There's two reasons why, though. One, the creation of feminist policies is only important insofar as it actually benefits the lives of the people on the ground. Our substantive is dedicated to showing you why they don't actually have that on their side. The second reason we're willing to trade it off is because if it's, like, policy efficiency is only important insofar as the intention is good as well. We think oppressive politicians in their side of the house coming from conservative nations, don't actually care about the liberation of women. They don't actually care about the progression of their rights, and we think, therefore, the policies they're likely going to be creating aren't that great in the first place. No, how the three minutes of the P1 speech directly reinforces this idea. They can see that African nations are conservative, and we think that's true as well, and something that's uniquely harmful. The intention is likely going to be bad in creating policies. With that setup done, let's take into consideration what they told you about. They give you an argument about why you need a woman to engage in economics and why that's uniquely important. Three strategic responses here. One, we both agree there is a problem that is here and we think there is a problem that, need to be, that needs to be solved. However, we don't think the substantive directly clashed with as to why they have the unique solution on their side. Second, we think the AU does have the capacity to agree on things like social policies. They do have the capacity to agree on things like economical policies. However, we think the things that are uniquely decisive, divisive are the things around things like identity politics and the things around things like queer rights or things like feminist rights. We think those are the things that uniquely divide and reduce the capacity of the AU to make decisions. We think then that you don't have to abandon things like 2063 laws, but we think those are uniquely harder on their side. They don't have the increased capacity on their side. The last reason is because they do have the fear to assume that prioritization can happen, but they don't have the fear to assume that they're going to have the best quality of policies created or they're going to have the highest quality of prioritization leading to better like quality of life for the women on the ground. These three responses are important insofar as they show you that an argument is based in the wrong context and the wrong strategy, therefore it's not something that actually mechanistically works. With that in consideration, it's up and right. However, my substantive directly clashes with this idea, with this idea, I'll flag you when I get there. In consideration of that rebuttal, onto the first argument then about the illegitimacy to have AU implementation of feminist policies. Before I move on to this argument, I'll take a few on. Um, so when we look at like, the AU, even if the policy is not efficient in practical sense, don't you think these value the shifting narratives that are portrayed? We're going, they don't shift narratives that the policies aren't effective. However, principally, we're going to show you that it's still a bad thing. On the argument then about the illegitimacy to have the AU implement feminist policies, there are two levels of analysis here. First, in status quo, when talking about matters of identity and when talking about matters of the people who matter the most, we care about representation over efficiency. Take into consideration how that's why court, Supreme Court cases around affirmative action or Supreme Court cases around abortion were heavily critiqued because they did not take into consideration the representation of the people on the ground and the representation of the people who are most affected by those issues. We think then that moral parity applies here and they're illegitimate because the AU is structurally created for men and by men. We think AU board members are largely individuals who aren't women and you don't think you have representation in that instance. So because you don't have representation and representation is uniquely important, AU implementation on their side is illegitimate. The second reason as to why AU implementation is illegitimate is because it opposes the roles and the obligations of the AU. A bit of framing goes into understanding this analysis. The reason as to why the AU is divisive and the reason as to why the AU is inefficient is two reasons. One, you have countries that are in different economical positions. So oftentimes countries aren't in the same state of their economy, they're oftentimes in very different positions. But secondly, countries have different conflicts and many conflicts that are oftentimes impact how they interact with each other. Therefore, given this, the AU has a direct mandate to first combine countries to ensure that there is a co cohesiveness that exists with the nations in trying to decrease things like conflicts, in trying to de decrease things like tensions. That is the AU's first mandate. They are likely going to do this worse on their side because things like social identity politics, things like identity politics around queer rights or feminist liberation are likely going to be things that are the most divisive. Given the fact that different cultural interpretations exist within African nations, different ideas around what gender norms, things like policy 
policies are. We think then they're likely going to be worse for those things, and we think since they're opposing AU rules and AU obligations, it's illegitimate for the AU to implement this policy. This argument was important because we think you cannot accept, no matter the practical, no matter the consequence that they're likely going to bring, you cannot accept that as it's principally illegitimate. The next argument then is about how you have ineffective policies on their side. Note, this argument directly clashes with what the first told us, and we think it's integrated rebuttal. This argument has three levels. The first reason you're going to have inefficient policies is because you're likely going to have stagnation. This is true given the fact that you're going to have an inefficiency in creating decisions and you're going to have an inefficiency in passing things like motions. That's because one, you're going to have a need on census agreements. So you're going to have long votes that take time in creating policies. But two, you're going to need to find a blanket solutions. Solutions that can encompass every country's policies and country and sponsors that are likely going to encompass all the countries who are engaging there. The second reason as to why you are likely going to have stagnation is because you have conservative countries that are in the conversations. These countries aren't the types of countries that want to engage with liberal action or that want to actually introduce feminist policies. We think given that stagnation, then you're going to have ineffective policies on their side. That's important because they don't actually get better quality of policies from the people on the ground. The second reason as to why you're going to have ineffective policies is because bureaucracies are very bad in creating policies. There's three reasons here. The first is because the majority of countries aren't going to accept those principles. The second reason is because AU agreements aren't actually binding. We think countries aren't forced to implement policies. Countries aren't necessitated to create some type of policy on the ground. We think stances can be passed, but we think countries don't actually have to do things if they don't want to. The third reason is because you're likely going to have a heavy focus on other issues and not necessarily this prioritization. So we think they can get prioritization on their side, but it's not likely going to be the highest quality of prioritization. It's not likely going to be prioritization that's impactful to the people who matter the most. The last reason as to why you're going to get ineffective policies is because you're going to falsify progression. When you create the narrative that AU has family specific policies, you're going to create the narrative that things are actually changing when they aren't for the people on the ground. That means then that you're going to have less accountability for these individuals and it's going to be harder to hold them accountable, given the fact that there's a performative change that exists. Given the fact that they are not principled and they have ineffective policies, only the opposition can win. I'll be beginning my speech in three, two, one. It's an old, old tale, the panel. It's an old, it's an old, age old tale, panel. If you speak up, they will hurt you, so stay silent, even though they will continue to hurt you in your silence. Because of the fact that people that benefit from your oppression won't want to shift willingly, you just need to stay quiet in that oppression and don't let them continue to do this to you, and then proceed to claim to not be against women empowerment, proceed to claim to still care about you as a vulnerable actor, even though every single mechanism we provide actually guarantees violence on your side, actually guarantees further enabling these countries to harm these women. Now, first of all, to address the counter idea that we get from their side of countries collectivizing within themselves that have similar ideologies and similar um, and similar like economic stances in order to enact these sort of policies, that's such an insane idea. Let's have the countries that you characterize as being conservative and not wanting these people to have rights to collectivize to enforce these feminist policies because they'll get along better because they have similar ideologies. So they have the similar ideologies, but it's ideologies that go against what we as the house want. It's ideologies that go against the empowerment of women that we value on both sides of the house from what we get from the first speeches. And from what we get on the first speeches. And with that said, on the second point of rebuttal, on the idea of how the AU is divisive and inefficient because of the different, different economic positions and because of the different conflicts and the different ideologies that go on and how they value cohesion in order to achieve AU's goals and achieve better efficiency, the problem we have with this cohesion is that it's cohesion that is rooted or based on being complacent in oppression. And at the point at which you have your cohesion based on this, your idea of people now, your, um, your um, change becomes even harder once the AU, if, if we reach these 2063 goals and you have based your cohesion on being complacent in oppression, on sacrificing almost half of the population, uh, yeah. this entire gender, on the basis of the fact that some people don't agree on it, at the point in which we do, for say, uh, say, reach our 2063 goal, change, first of all, becomes even harder. It becomes even harder to shift these narratives because keeping these narratives in place is how we got here in the first place. Why would we get rid of it now? But you cannot claim to defend the women in this 
debate. If you're going to claim, if you're going to prioritize this economic advancement, this economic development over the lives of women in this debate, say so. The soft lining is weird. It makes you make um, contradictions in your case, and it makes you run um, principles that clash with each other, or principles that clash with the practical outcomes that you claim that you value, like efficiency, like having cohesion. Before I move on to my positive matter, I'll take that POI. Speaker, please note that you want to appeal to the very same people that you both characterize as oppressive. How exactly are you willing to succeed in this instance? I'll flag you when I get to that in my positive matter. So, on to my first argument in this debate. It's why the threat of retaliation does not justify remaining complacent in oppression. If we didn't fight things because so-and-so may be mad panel, we wouldn't be sitting here in a room full of black and brown debaters. This idea is old, tired, and disproved by history. The suffragettes, it's seen in, with um, things like the suffragette movement, things like ending slavery, which is a form of oppression spanning continents that a literal economic system was based on, and things like the LGBTQIA movement. So what happens here is that there is a challenge of entrenched ideals, and in response to this challenge, there is violence, like the civil war when it comes to slavery, and like suffragettes being arrested and harmed because of the fact that they were challenging these systems. And the first thing that happens is that there is greater challenging, so things get heated, basically, due to this retaliation and due to this violent retaliation from the oppressor. And what happens for, in almost every single case, is that we see resolution on some level, like the suffragettes, like with slavery, like with the LGBTQIA movement. We are okay with the backlash. We are okay with dealing with the violence for the following reasons. Now, first of all, staying complacent guarantees violence anyways. That mom in Congo, just because she's quiet and doesn't advocate for her rights, just because the AU is quiet and doesn't advocate for her rights, she's still getting shot at, she's still being harmed. It doesn't change anything on their side. But even more than that, at the point at which it, it doesn't change anything on their side, complacency and silence has never um, faced marginalized groups, and it won't save them in this context. But further, at the point at which inaction still doesn't protect you, we value action at the point at which, first of all, uh, at the point at which we have seen even smaller groups, even f smaller actors be successful when they took action against extremely large oppressive factors. So when you see the suffragette women going up against the whole entire US government and men in the country, and we still see that this produced benefits today, we believe that the AU, being an economic and political alliance, can do the same thing, and I will provide mechanisms for this in my second argument, but before I get into that final POI. Your side keeps on telling us that you're staying complacent in oppression. Please tell us why African men have any incentive to go to the AU and fight for change in Ashley legislature. Okay, so now what I'm going to do in my second argument here is that let's characterize the AU in more nuance and not just like the things that we see on paper. Now when you look at the biggest actors in the AU, they acknowledge that there's economic differences, there's political differences. One of the biggest actors in the AU is South Africa and to a largely smaller scale, um, and to a um, somewhat smaller scale, Nigeria. When we characterize South Africa, we know that South Africa is one of the most liberal countries, if not the most liberal and progressive country within Africa, and that they are also the economic power House of this entire lower section of Africa, and Nigeria is the economic powerhouse of the section of Africa that they exist within. So now, if it means, so now what this means is that from the nature of these countries, we know that these governments, we know that these governments, first of all, have a mandate, second of all, have, have incentive to include women within these policies because of the nature that has already been established in status quo. But further than that, because of the fact that these countries have more economic and political stronghold than other countries within the AU, within this debate, if it means that we are going to use economic incentives like restricting or providing access to AU benefits through the progression of this project, we will do so if it means that we protect the vulnerable actor that we identify to be the woman of Africa within this debate, to be the woman of Africa within this debate. But even further, we value the cultural narrative that comes from doing this. At the point at which we value the cultural narrative that comes from doing this, at the point at which these women are suffering, these women are living in terror, and these women are being terrorized and you say nothing, you just tell them that we can't incentivize African men to do this, you just tell them that we can't do anything in order to help you, you do not help the problem but exacerbate it. We want the women in these countries to see that the AU, even if only on a, on a policy level, even if only within their policy, does consider them and does see them as a part of their new Africa and not the sacrifice that must be made in order for this new Africa to be possible. We value these women seeing that on a principal level they are supported and they are seen and even when there is retaliation, even when there's people that do not want to buy in, we prioritize them as Africans as a 
the African Union, we value seeing this, we value doing this for these women, because at the point at which you are so dehumanized, humanization is one of the most valuable things on earth. The women within these countries are not sacrifices to be made. They are not inconveniences that agitate African men in power, and they are not people that you can simply put to the side for the sake of achieving your economic goals. They are Africans. The African Union is meant to cater to Africans, and if it means that we need to, if it means that we need to twist arms, if it means that we need to tell you that you do not get access to these benefits, these economic benefits that you need, especially because you're not economic strongholds, then we will do so. We will do so because at the end of the day, we prioritize these women above all. And economic advancement, economic progress doesn't mean anything at the point at which the people within these economies don't even get, don't even get benefit or merit from it. And with that said, I've never been prouder to propose. Thank you. We'll be starting in three, two, one. When the EU made agreements to recognize and respect gay rights, Libya, Egypt, Uganda, all had homophobic laws strictly directly after all of those agreements were made. Libya, a country that had the first ever female president within African history, had plans of having to give girls free education to ensure that they were free and to ensure that they were not shackled by the very same rhetoric that the proposition gives you. Today, women face the threat of having to die because of the fact that they are likely going to be raped by those very same teachers that were supposed to provide that very same free education. And the prop expects us to rely on these very same countries to provide policies that are actually going to provide women support and that are actually going to provide women the stability that they wanted to give women. Katu's speech was quite emotional, but it was also assertive because it was reliant on a dream that is never yet to be proposed for majority of women in the first place. Three strategic flaws that most of the, like the proposition makes on their side. The first is because is the fact that the majority of the argumentation is uncontentious. We agree that women need to be protected. We agree that women need to actually be recognized much more. But we don't agree on the fact that the AU needs to be the institution having to facilitate majority of those things. That's where the debate needed to take place in. And at no point did they actually argue for why it is that the AU is likely going to be getting that change in the first place. So they don't actually fulfill their burden, they don't actually fulfill whatever it is that they needed to be arguing for in the first place. The second thing is that they scroll away from their burden. They needed to show us why it is that the AU is within the best position to do this, especially with the analysis that we told you about its inefficiencies, especially with the analysis that we told you about its backsliding governments and the fact that we can't rely on those individuals. The reason why this is so important is because of the fact that the AU always had the precedent of not being able to, ma like, to, to be, like, not being able to actually actually execute like perfect policies on social issues. That's why you don't have the very same like um, like social um, progression that you want within Africa in the first place. The third thing is that they have a huge slippery slope here, like the arguing on the extremes. In response to the POI that we gave them about gay rights and all of those things, their response was quite simple. Should we just abandon the entire plan in the first place? Here's why that was an extreme case. The first is because of the fact that Africa always will agree on economic issues because of the fact that they main priority is to ensure that Africa is economically free. But they will never agree on social issues because of the fact that they still rely on conservative rhetoric, but also demonize the West and want to oppose all other forms of Western progression in the first place. That's the AU that they needed to defend, and that's the AU that they needed to rely on to actually defend women in the first place. Nonsensical that they can come up here with a dream and not actually substantiate as to why it's possible. Let's look at the two clashes then in this debate. The first is is the AU able to implement all of the things that proposition want? The second is that whether or not it's legitimate to do this. Let's do the second one because that's the closest line that they have to victory. What do they tell us? They tell us two things. The first is that we should not be complacent in oppression. Agree? That's not something that's contentious within this, in this draft. But the assumption that they make is that women haven't been able to speak up for themselves outside of the AU. Why isn't this true? That women have always had, have always been on the agenda of having to progress their own issues regardless of whether or not the AU has been involved. So think of people like Ellen Johnson Sirleaf who were able to be like the first ever female president within Africa without having to rely on the AU, without having to rely on other African leaders to get there. Think of icons such as Chim 
Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, who didn't like men within Africa, and who didn't like the fact that the AU was stampeding on women's rights. And these are the kinds of individuals who are most likely going to be progressing women on our side. We don't think that they have much of a leg to stand on here. But why is it that this is something that actually helps us? Two reasons. One, it's because of the fact that you have less dependency on the very same oppressors that actually harmed individuals. But secondly, it's that on our side, we have a stronger movement because of the fact that women are controlling these agendas. Notice how Katu conveniently decided to ignore majority of the analysis that Osiyame gave you. The fact that majority of the representation is going to be coming from individuals who have no idea what women's issues look like, who have no idea how it is that they're going to be tackling inefficiencies of women's problems. These are the very same people that they want to rely on, and they don't actually prove why it is that they should be. The second thing that they tell us here is that they're going to like value the cultural narrative of having to change like certain things. This assumes that women actually want the help from the AU. The reason why this isn't true is because of the fact that there's been a heavy disconnect between governments and their and women in particular. That's to say that women have continuously opposed the policies that the AU have been having because of the fact that they most likely don't represent the most amount of women. So you don't change any narrative because of the fact that the opposition to the AU has already existed within status quo. They don't actually solve most of those problems. Second question on is the AU able to like implement all of these things that you have? What do you actually have within Africa right now? What you have are backsliding autocratic governments that don't re represent the majority of women. This looks like two things. One is backsliding on the agreements that you make within the EU, or AU rather, like the, the gay rights agreement. But secondly is that there's a lack of accountability in the instances in which these countries actually oppress you. That's because of the fact that women aren't involved in politics, but furthermore, that they aren't respected within the social narratives that they wanted to talk about. No, thank you. What do we then get from the proposition in this case? They tell us that they want to relieve people of any harm. This argument assumes that women are not likely going, are likely going to have their best interests catered for by their policy. Why isn't, isn't this true? Two reasons. One is because of the fact that African countries have historically harmed women in a variety of ways. Two ways and two in particular, no thank you. One is because of the fact that political involvement of women has always been downturned by the very same AU that they wanted to talk about. But secondly, it's because of the fact that the safety of women and their ability to be protected has always been limited. So you can't rely on the AU because of the fact that those are the very same institutions that have allowed for that oppression to exist in the first place. But the second reason why this isn't true is because of the fact that the AU itself is largely male dominated and it's less likely going to listen to more women because of the fact that they don't have that bargaining power in the first place. What this rebuttal has shown you is why the fairy tale that Limpopo has is going to be the broken dream of why it is that they fail in today's debate. Before I move into my argumentation of the deprioritization of social issues. Entity. Let's say characterization of social issues what model do you propose to protect women unless Here's the thing. We don't have to propose women. The debate is about specifically the AU doing all of these things. But secondly, we think that in status quo, you've already had some level of progression without the AU in these instances. So think of the fact that Ellen Johnson Sirleaf existed within times where you didn't need the AU. Think of people like Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. These examples are quite relevant. This argument is going to tackle the POI of like why it is that the value of these policies is going to be undermined. This is for two reasons. The first is because of the fact that you create more divisive narratives around women's issues for two reasons. One is because of the fact that you have a heavily polarized perception of feminism. That's to say that most African leaders that have vocalized women's concerns talk about them in a very conservative vacuum. That's where you get more polarization because of the fact that you don't allow for liberal ideas and you don't allow for the ideas of women to actually surface through discussions. But secondly, that you allow for African countries to dictate the problems of women. This is particularly bad when we talk about the demographic of women within majority of the AU. Comparatively, on our side, when you have the status quo that has been able to be successful, you have individuals having to actually look at women's issues in a more like a specific sense, but furthermore, you have women having to defend themselves against that very same AU rhetoric you can only oppose. Hannah, there's been a lot of confusion and contention going around in this room, and I'm going to start by doing a little bit of cleanup. 
three specific points of clarity, right? Throughout um, from proposition from opposition one till like second speech, we haven't first of all identified like mitigation of actual harms that they propose to us on their side. More than that, we haven't achieved any comparative that shows to you that number one, um, they achieve a better marginal benefit than what we propose to you. But more than that, they don't do enough to defend the idea of the status quo. We get an inconsistent policy from proposition one going on to proposition two, and this then encompasses the ideas of like misogyny and principal consistency that I'll point out in my speech. But let me show you something important. The only things that we needed to prove are twofold. Number one, we needed to show you that it is in the best interest for the AU goals to include a feminist, like to include a feminist project. Note, proposition, opposition has completely chosen to like isolate or ignore the fact that um, the, pro, the like the main idea for African Union doing this, including a feminist project, is for like the economic benefit that they're supposed to get in 2063, right? And this is specifically important. We do this by number one, like legitimizing the actor, and number two, showing you why the actor is justified in terms of capacity. The second thing we needed to prove to you is that the goals in the AU agenda are more effectively reached when equality is actively addressed, specifically in African countries, right? We do this by two things. Number one, we show you how like uplifting economic and social status of a disenfranchised group creates number one, like an equal plane in an equal plane field, which allows for upward mobility. Note that they don't engage with this. But two, we show you the value of like inclusive participation of women, specifically in like economic and political spheres, right? What does proving this do? What does proving this do for us in this debate, right? We think this number one makes us the better side in ensuring the tangible progression of success in the AU agenda by 2063. But more than that, it actively targets structural issues that impede equality politics that exist, right? What proposition, like on the opposite side, what opposition needed to prove is that they needed to show us the direct disconnect between the achievement of AU's goals in 2063, which they haven't addressed at all, but more than that, they had to show us this link between like um, addressing political and structural oppression of women. Now, the biggest clash, like, getting into my clashes, the biggest clash that exists is in the idea of capacity and efficiency of AU as an actor. From um, from the proposition idea, like we get from proposition, you get the idea that like um, proper, uh, we get the idea that the AU is the most beneficial actor to do this. It is in number one their mandate, and you get the idea of legitimizing the act, right, in various ways. And I'll continue to show you how this is. On opposition side, you get the idea that like um, the AU is incapacitated to do this because number one, there's no representation in in like the AU, it's mostly men, and thus this creates no incentive. Note that they don't show us how like there's there being more men in the specific space directly relates to there being no incentive to include women. But more than that, we get the idea that like blanket solutions will be brought by AU, right? Which then affect the quality of like policy creation. I'm going to show you why this doesn't work. But before I get into that, your PI. Okay, now let's get into like why these ideas of them illegitimizing AU doesn't work, right? So we think what has been purposefully ignored by the, pro the opposition side is the idea of like variations of feminism and how they exist in different parts of the world. We think they completely choose to ignore that the existence of Africanized or like African ideals in feminism exist in contrast to like Western feminism, right? We think it's important to understand that Western liberal feminism and African feminism looks very different. This is why we're having the conversation, right? The idea here is that we achieve better marginal benefit and cultural representation, right? We think this then translates into the AU being the best actor because they are based number one in African countries. This is to say that we don't think um, westernized feminism directly translates and covers like African feminism and directly addresses the issues, right? We think women in African countries fight for very different things as opposed to women in liberal Western countries, right? This looks like um, women in African countries still fighting against genocide, still fi fighting against misogyny, et cetera, et cetera, right? We think women in liberal Western countries still fight for like better, like they still have access, they have accessibility to things like pride marches, et cetera, and like there's just a lot of more evolved feminist ideas, right? This is why number one, we think it's important to then um, have African-based feminism, right? And this is why we think the African Union is the best actor to do this. Number one, we tell you like, um, 
We think because the African country is based in Africa, these are better, they are better actors to number one, identify the struggles of African countries because they are the ones who stay here. And my second speaker gave an example of like Nigeria and South Africa. But more than that, we think they're the better actor to proper pay specific attention to issues that affect African countries. The incentive here is easy panel. We think because the idea here is like direct progression via economics panel, we think this then directly clashes with the idea about like men not being able to like be incentivized, right? So we think even when we don't include like incentives, like economic incentives, and so the idea that South Africa is being liberal, which is something that my first speaker has brought in, my second speaker has brought in as well. We think even if this wasn't so, we show you on a pro, on a comparative scale, that the common goal of the AU here is progression. Progression via like economic progression. We think the men in, the men in these spaces value this economic progression, right? Regardless of the cost. We think when the AU prioritizes upward mobility, this is, looks like this looks like women being afforded like equal opportunity to be able to be in workspaces. This then creates a better workforce, translating to like a better economy because women are working, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. The idea of a common goal proves as incentive for men to like number one, open up spaces and actively have women. We don't think progression can occur when there's no equal level. But more than that, the PR. Most of the activism that you're talking about has happened without the aid. Think of Winnie Mandela, think of Ross Michelle. Why do we need them now? We think it's important to note that representation of Western feminism has largely influenced African feminism and like, created that blanket, right? We think we need AU as a representative body because AU does not only like um, highlight feminism, but it uplifts these women like when we talk about political and economic structures, right? We think it's not enough for Winnie Mandela and another woman, the other women that you gave to simply represent women like street marches, protests, and just get general self-actualization. But what we think is important is representation in political and economic spheres. And this is what we use as the AU as a proponent to do, right? We think AU better, number one, it's in the interest of like AU goals to better achieve their economic stability and the economic progression that they, they want to go to when like there's women there. And more than that, we think this then creates like that incentive of benefit, right? We think it's important to note that like proposition purposefully chooses to not engage with the idea of like the harms of not necessarily being inherent on our side. But more than that, they don't prove to us how the harms are mitigated on their side, right? So the idea is that we reject proposition policy, but they don't necessarily do enough to prove to us that like the harms are mitigated on this side. And this is detrimental to their case. Because number one, it shows you that we better achieve AU mandate and we better like validate the AU as an actor in order to prioritize this economic development, right? We Better, we do better for incentive when we tell you that it's okay if men don't like necessarily understand representation and if they don't want. What's going to incentivize them is the idea of a, con a, a common economic goal, right? I think this proves there's better incentive for men to like continue opting into this. What we prove to you or what we give you, however, on our side is a sense of marginal benefit. We tell you that number one, we unify different levels of like feminism, different types of feminism, because we are true to the ideas of feminism existing in Africa and not being influenced by the West. We true and we are true to this and we uplift these like forms of feminism in different countries, however they exist, better on our side because number one, we give them like more political benefits and better representation on our side. Right? What proposition needs to do to you is to prove the direct disconnect between these achievements and the Panel, towards the end of slavery, the United States had legislation telling you that black people were equal, telling you that, look, you are free, but guess what? They weren't. We still had need for resistance. We still had need to show you that even though you can legislate against something, it doesn't mean that it's working practically. We don't think that proposition gets the yeah, proposition gets to claim those benefits on their side. We don't think the fact that they have feared to legislate something and to make it a part of their goals automatically means that they have feared to assume that it's effective they've yet to show us effectiveness. Let's clarify here. What is our policy like? What is our counter model? Because they keep on pushing this to us. Oh no, they don't have a comparative. Let's note, firstly, we don't have to prove this to you. We just have to prove to you why there is worse things and why it doesn't necessarily help women. Secondly, why the AU isn't the best actor. But note, we do have a counter model. They just chose to ignore it. That isn't our fault. That's a strategic flaw on their end. So two clashes then that you should evaluate this debate on. Firstly, then, who's best for women? The only thing that they're willing to engage with was quite difficult to find clashes. Then the second thing then on the AU goals 
and whether or not they're justified as they are. But firstly, let's just take a look at some strategic flaws that had us this debate. So firstly, let's just assert, let's just deal with the fact that they assert that there's going to be change. We've already shown you that legislation doesn't equate being on the ground. We think their characterization works against them because they are the ones that tell us that they're conservative, that the men here oppress women there, that they don't, that women don't even feel safe within these countries. We don't think that going on to the AU and sitting with a bunch of other men that believe these same things is all of a sudden going to get this. If anything, they're going to legislate it. They're going to be like, yeah, we care about these goals. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're incentivized to implement it. Even on the UN, when they vote on things and they agree on things, it doesn't mean that people necessarily go back to their countries as diplomats and implement it and legislate it and make sure that it works out. We think agreements just work and they're falsified on their side. They've yet to tell us why they don't have falsification and why falsification is still beneficial for their side. We're going to show you why they lose that debate based on that. But then secondly, what is the AU and how do they work? Because Katu tries to give us some explanation. She's like, oh no, we have bodies like South Africa and Nigeria that are like liberal minded and they're able to do a lot of things and sway and have persuasion and influence. Okay, great, that works for our side too. Because we told you that our analysis is that we're gonna have regional bodies and that type of stuff, and we're still able to promote feminism that way. But we're better because South Africa is able to speak to countries and have like one-on-one -on -one conversations and direct responses without being backed by all the bigots. It needs to say that if it's in a space where majority of the people are bigoted and a small minority of the people are liberal-minded, it's very difficult for the liberals to have any form of say or anything that's progressive because of the amount of backlash that exists only on their side uniquely there. On our side, when we have South Africa engaging with more like conservative and like bigoted countries, they're likely to have more sway and actually influence their policy making because of the lack of opposition and the lack of back and forth. So when you're doing the way up between who's best for like feminism and actually convincing countries to change, you have to side with the opposition. And then lastly, on like this idea of economic incentives and them taking out their mechanism, they're like, listen, because countries have economic incentives, the AU can just like legislate against it and like economically sanction countries that don't like adhere to this legislation. That's lies, panel, because the AU's main incentive is economic growth. They told us about this. We don't think that African countries are likely to act in a way that harms their economic interests. That's nonsense. It doesn't stand in this debate. Because when it comes to the AU and, and like countries developing, economics is an important part of it, and they can't just ignore it. We think their side is worse for it. They don't actually help anything. If anything, they blame women for these things. They're going to say, look, because of you women, now we don't have economic growth. They're worse off for women on their side. On to my first task about why we're about who's better for women. What do we tell you that they don't engage with? We give you practical analysis as to why their side is likely to be inefficient, right? We tell you about like bureaucracies, we tell you about falsified progression, and we tell you this idea about stagnation because of how inefficient they are. It means that policies that are actually meant to help women aren't thriving on their side. They tell us African feminism. Fun and games, that's all cool. We can have that too. We give you practical examples. We tell you about Winnie Mandela, about Garcia Michelle. We tell you about Amanda Ngozi that exists without the help of the AU. They're better, we're better on that side as well. Well, but they can't just say that they have African feminism that makes them superior in this debate. We can have African feminism, right? But note, their principle is contingent on a practical outcome. Their whole people don't have human rights. People feel unsafe in their countries. Only stands if they're able to fix that. We don't think that they are. Why then are we better for like women and women's activism, right? We think the AU and men who sit on panels in their best case do not have the right to make laws that affect women and tell you why they're better for feminism because they don't face these issues in the same way. How do we fix this problem? And the only way we can buy into their case is if they show us how they're magically going to put women on the AU, while they're going to put women with experience with women's struggles are gonna be able to advocate for other women. We don't think they get that because of their biased characterization. The alternative then on our side is we have women on the ground. We have women like Chima Amanda fighting for like women's rights, fighting for like African feminism as it is without the structural crop out of African men to say, look, it's in our goals. We're trying to get to that legislation without actually implementing it on a level. Because we can agree with them, maybe it'll get implemented. Maybe countries can falsify it and say, yeah, we'll have the progression. This is part of our goals. It doesn't mean it's going to work out. If anything, they're going to use it as a cop out. It means their side lacks accountability. They lack the eyes of international influence to condemn African countries for not being feminists, for not advocating for equalities. Their side doesn't help women. What they do is they help the men who sit on the AU to lie about what they're doing, to lie about all of their impacts and all of everything that they do for women without having any incentive to do so. Because these are structural issues panel and even legislation can hide structural reasons is the reason why it's the reason why microaggressions exist even in freer countries we think their side is worse for that because of how vulnerable African countries are specifically on an economic level we think we're winning this task based on who's better for women for two reasons firstly our side gets accountability 
outside doesn't let African countries hide behind legislation. But secondly, we don't undermine their activism by assuming that women need the men on the AU to back them up in order to get some sort of feminist ideal. That's something that only uniquely exists on the proposition they cannot win on this place for women. On to my next hash then, but before that, let's take a pure eye. Given that the whole political action that the EU and AU aren't to change, how are these women on the ground? Okay, why are women on the ground enough to cause change? Let's look at people and activists like Nelson Mandela and what happened in South Africa. We don't think that they need some sort of structural institution to back them up. If anything, we're better for like some sort of international buy-in because we're able to see, look at what the African women are doing. We're able to better back up African feminism because we don't have the cop-out of look, the structures behind them are also supporting them. We don't want you to believe for even one second that the men on the AU care about feminism because they've yet to prove it to us. What they do is they just get rid of people who are willing to like buy into feminism. We don't think that they can see that they don't have enough power. We think the power doesn't exist because they don't want it to happen. Men will never care about it because they have no incentive to on their side. They just have only have the incentive to falsify. Next on to the AU goals and what they're doing, right? So they characterize African countries to not care about women, but mostly to care about economic growth, right? And they're like, listen, this women don't get to like have the benefits of it. Let's trade off economic growth. They can't do that under any circumstances panel because what does it mean to live in an African country? It means it's not fair to live in a place where you have limited water, where you have limited access to resource. Their side was to section it and they want to pretend that that's better for women. Why is it better for women that live in impoverished neighborhoods to not have access to resources because they're being denied their rights simultaneously? That isn't okay under any circumstances panel. We think you still should be able to get economic benefits because women are still able to feel it. The second thing they do is it has a role undermining the whole AU's ability to like fulfill their other goals. We don't think that this is true. We think on their side, on our side, they're better able to full, fulfill the other goals without the cop-out of trying to pretend to also be like socially and like politically correct. We think we're better at fulfilling goals, but we think we're also justified in still giving people in impoverished neighborhoods and like impoverished countries some sort of economic growth because women are still harmed when their countries are in dire economic straits. Don't let them, don't make them, don't let them make you believe that women can protest on empty stomachs that doesn't exist. You have to side with opposition. I'll be starting in three, two, one. If you ask me, this Lipopo team is just a case study for why it is that rhetoric will never ever beat actual pure debate. In fact, that rhetoric will always come at the cost of you having to win a debate because of the fact that you couldn't create a proper case to defend a line that you should have. A couple of strategic flaws before we get into what actually happened within this debate. Three things. The first is that majority of the proposition case is like just straw money. That's to say that we give you a variety of layers that went unresponded to in the second and in the third reply is way too late for them to save their case. The second thing is that they assume that women have no capacity to defend themselves outside of the space of the AU. This is where we say that they undermine the power of women within Africa today. Let's look at the actual impact of, for example, the street marches that they were saying aren't good enough. Winnie Mandela I was able to ensure that women had their rights protected and had their rights recognized in apartheid merely because of the fact that she went on marches, merely because of the fact that she went on protests and ensured that women were protected in that way. People like uh, Madrasa Michal and people like Ellen Johnson certainly did the same and they didn't do it with the AU. They needed to prove to us why it is that women needed the AU in these kinds of instances. They haven't shown you one bit. The third thing is that they've been giving you largely contentious material. We can all agree what the like, needs of women actually are within Africa. But what we're disputing here is whether or not the AU is actually the right actor to be doing all of these things. And the best response that we get on their side is what are we doing? We, we, we tell you that you should look at history and you should look at how it is that women have engaged with the very same problematic governments we've, that we've had in the first place and the comparative is going to be far better on the opposition. First, on the clash then on principle. The principle that we get on their side is the fact that when, like the principle that we tell you, that whenever you need to have a repre like representation, that it is important that you include women and you include the minorities that are most likely going to be affected in those situations. 
The AU doesn't include women in majority of the things that they decide on. Therefore, they're not a legitimate actor to be enacting policies around feminist ideologies. The second thing that we told you is that they're an unreliable actor due to the varying problems that they have. That's to say that the only the only reason why it is that we don't consider certain individuals li like reliable for having to enact policies around social change is because of the fact that if they can't deal with their own issues first, and because of the fact that they have malicious incentives, then they aren't the people who are supposed to be representing you. They tell us that we need to have a lot of we don't like we have to need, we need to have a lot less complacency with women's issues. Notice how we gave you the response that women have always been there for each other, and women have always been able to enact policies for themselves and like garner like um, social change for themselves. This response damaged their case because it already shows you that there wasn't any complacency in the first place. That a lot of the things that we've done have ensured that women are able to be protected in the long run. It's only on our side that you get that principle being fulfilled. But the reason why it is that principally we're better is because of the fact that first you have less dependency on the AU in order for you to enact policies that are good. But the second thing is that you have a stronger movement because of the fact that you are actually listening to women's needs and you are letting women decide those needs in the first place. Second clash then on whether or not they are actually going to succeed. This is important because majority of their case was asserting that they are likely to succeed in the first place. Let's show you why it is that they don't actually need this. Two reasons. First is why exactly is the AU inefficient? We told you a couple of things. One is because of stagnation. There are three reasons why it is that the change that you're likely to get is going to be stagnant. One is because of the fact that you need a large consensus in order for you to actually create that change. We told you why it is that that consensus isn't likely to happen. The second we told you is that AU is largely bureaucratic. So you're less likely going to be getting that change happening at the time in which you need it. You're most likely going to get it like having to happen in the long term. And even then, you don't get efficient change. But the last thing we told you that you falsify progression. In their best case, you have blanket policies that don't actually represent women. In our worst case, that you have the ability for women to stand up against, to stand up for each other against the oppressive regimes that they want to talk about. Opposition presents a cloak of false caring, telling us they believe women need to see change, but specifically that there's no other structure that exists to bring about this change, but the AU also should not bring about this, this change. Thus, they clearly believe that women should remain in suffering because they do not tell us how in any way in their space and in their world this change will be achieved at all. A very important to note with this is the moment when you declare that you do not like the introduction of something within status quo but provide no alternative model that means you want to remain with the way status quo exists with all the harm with all the inequality and with all the terrorism of women in their own words this is important because women the actor that we have all zoned into as the most vulnerable remains in extremely harmful conditions and the future harms this future um goes this in the further harms the goals of the AU as a consequence of women not being prioritized as was spoken about in our first speech and also they tried to about this counter idea in the third speech by telling us that these women will be able to advocate for their own change and will receive incentive from will receive support from Western um, countries. Well, I think this is too late to bring about a counter idea, but even, well, even with this, there's some there is an element of a uh, lack of explanation and analysis on how this would apply within the actual world. Because, first of all, if we have characterized and even, not even context the characterization that Western feminism has no care for African feminism, how did they receive this incentive from the Western states and from um, Western feminism? But at the same time, um, they present the idea that women have power to create change, but then they don't tell us why this power cannot be extended to um, enforcing African states within the African Union to to enact change. They do not tell us this, but at the same time, even with organizations, even with individuals like women who advocate for change, these individuals often um, are represented by organizations and do not carry this power themselves. Organizations that could in this case be like the AU. But the main clashes that I actually want to tackle um, after those um, important things to note is the clash on legitimacy of the AU and the clash on the effectiveness of this idea. Now, they tell us that African countries will not implement it and we 
will not agree to it because of their conservative nature. But we're going to tell you that by the goals of the AU, even in this, even if we then zone into the goal of the economic development, even if they do not care exactly about women or specifically or directly about women because of the effect that it has on the economic state and the social states of their country, they will still have an incentive to do this. So even if they, the incentive can still um, occur that they care about women, but even when they don't, in the worst case, they still have an incentive in the idea of the goals that they hold. Um, and they do not even respond to this idea on how women not when women being harmed harms the goals of the AU as well, despite having brought it up um, numerous times. But at the same time, they tell you that this will not be effective and it will be stagnant due to the identity that these um, states hold. Not only again is it pushed by the uh, is this point on our side pushed by the idea of us having these goals as an incentive for them to do this, but at the same time that my second speaker tells you that there are liberal countries that exist that hold immense power for enforcement and enactment within the AU to allow for this to actually occur within status quo, that is important to note. And then they do not respond to the idea of, they do not respond